Sitting back watching the NCAA tournament, I'm reminded that many of our favorite NFL stars at one point or another had hoop dreams of their own. But eventually, and this is usually in high school, they awaken from the hoop dreams to the reality of the field. Football is a commitment where you gotta be all in. If you're not, she'll find another and she'll settle down with him. He might be less talented, but if he commits, then he's got a chance to win her heart and live happily. But today we're talking about one of the few players who was so great that despite his infidelity, football waited on him. If you decide to watch any of the NCAA tournament, I want you to keep this story in the back of your mind. You never know what these cats might grow to become. And that was never more true than 2002. After winning the MAC Conference Championship game, most assumed they'd lose in the first round of the NCAA tournament. But 10 seed Kent State took out three higher seeded teams on their way to an improbable Elite Eight appearance. It was a magical run with a scrappy team full of misfits, but among them was a Hall of Famer from a completely different sport. This is the story of Antonio Gates and how a college basketball player became one of the greatest tight ends of all time. Y'all know what time it is, man. Chew the way. Antonio Gates grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and while the friends he grew up with weren't inherently bad people, many of them couldn't see past their own surroundings, and they fell into the same traps many young guys fall into. Bro, it was so bad that dude couldn't answer phone calls until his junior year in high school. That's crazy. But Gates realized early on that if he wanted to go further, a little bit of discipline would actually help him on his journey. He would have to find people who wanted the same things he wanted and to separate himself from those who were getting into trouble. He found those people playing sports, so he applied himself there, playing basketball and football during his high school days. He recognized early that he had God-given ability, naturally strong, but he worked hard to harness those powers. Antonio came from a long bloodline of fighters, and while I mean that figuratively, I also mean it literally. His granddad dad was Henry Armstrong or Homicide Hank, aka Hurricane Hank, aka Hammerin' Hank. Hank collected championships across three different weight classes and retired with 152 wins and 20 losses. So athleticism's not the only thing he passed down, as Antonio was blessed with durability and longevity. Gates was a star, man, in football and basketball. I'm talking first team all state in both sports. But there comes a time where a kid has to choose. And after what I'm about about to say you think his choice would be obvious so in high school he had a game where he scored six touchdowns four on offense and two on defense here's a clip of his former coach telling the story it's from a clip on a youtube channel called the field of 68. And one time antonio in high school scored six touchdowns four as a receiver two on the defensive end intercepted the ball ran it in for a touchdown and sacked the quarterback picked up the ball and ran it in for a touchdown so he was highly recruited as a football player on offense and defense. Florida, Florida State, Miami, LSU, Michigan, Michigan hey. State. He was like unbelievable. He, so I remember Nick Saban come to Central with his staff telling us that if Antonio came to Michigan State and played football, after two or three years, he would be a professional football player. He had all the attributes to be a great player. He was athletic, had great hands. He can play offense or defense. Despite the attention he was getting from his work on the field, Antonio still just wanted to play basketball. Every summer when his football teammates would be doing two-a-days, Antonio would be balling out in the AAU circuit. There he played against some of the top basketball talent and according to his coach, man, he more than held his own. Well, Antonio, like myself, was in love with basketball. He just wanted to play basketball and he was dominating in basketball. But I can remember him on the AAU circuit playing for the Michigan Mur uh, Mustangs. At that point, he was playing against like the Tracy McGrady's of the world and he would go to Vegas and they won the big time and he would dominate all the top players so in his mind he felt he wanted to play basketball and go to the nba in detroit at that time basketball was everything the court was where you got respect popularity and bragging rights antonio had dominated around the city for years gaining the admiration of his two younger siblings his senior year he made them both proud on the basketball court when he led Central High to a state championship antonio was the man but when his little brother was caught wearing his gear out in the street he was robbed at gunpoint, but they didn't just rob him, they shot him in the back, giving Antonio the biggest scare of his life. That's how fragile life could be where Antonio grew up. One day you can be on top of the world just brimming with potential, 
But every time you left your house, you walked into a danger zone. You could be so close to getting out and still get pulled back in. Thankfully, Antonio's little brother survived, giving Gates a new focus to make something of himself. But as recruitment letters continued to pour in, he would have to make a choice between football and basketball. So all of his football letters would be schools like Michigan, while the basketball letters would be from smaller mid-majors. But despite that, for Gates, man, the choice was still easy. Dude wanted to play basketball at any cost. But then a unique opportunity arose, a chance to do both in his home state of Michigan. He accepted a football scholarship to Michigan State with some kind of understanding that he'd play basketball as well. But for some reason, things actually changed once he got there. And this part of the story does leave a couple questions, but each telling of the story is a little bit different and they don't go into as much detail as I prefer. Shortly after Antonio got to Michigan State, he's told by head coach Nick Saban that he won't be able to play basketball. He would instead need to focus solely on football, that plus keeping all his grades up to par. According to Antonio's side, the plan was always to play both, but they don't explicitly say Nick Saban agreed to this plan because the way it comes across is like he basically lied to get Gates to the school and then changed up on him. But it could also be that Gates never shared this plan and just assumed he'd be able to play both once he got there. If that seems naive and therefore unbelievable, you gotta consider the fact that Gates knew nothing about college. It's well documented that he didn't know how the recruiting system worked. He didn't understand that if he signed for football that they controlled his rights. On top of that, he knew little about college in general and he chose Michigan State due to the freedom the students had. Remember, he's coming from a really strict home, so that freedom, that was something that really appealed to him. But what he didn't realize was that these new freedoms were the norm at almost every college in the country. So after the freedom illusion was gone and basketball was off the table, Gates was no longer interested in attending the school. Saban tried to reason with him, saying he was a surefire NFL player, but Antonio Gates never played a down of college football. He transferred to Eastern Michigan as a full-time basketball player, and he was happy to have proof that freedom could be found at any college. First time being out of his strict home and he quickly lost focus, he was having the time of his life, but he allowed his grades to slip. This led to transferring again, this time to a JUCO. So from a big time D1, down to a mid-major, now down to a junior college, and that made two things very clear. He was quickly running out of time and he was going in the wrong direction. All of that talent, all of those options, but now it seemed as if he was running out of moves. It's like he was getting pressed at the line but hadn't developed the technique to get off. He feared that if he didn't get himself together soon, he would waste the opportunities that he'd been blessed with. Then something happened that allowed him to course correct. As his old high school coach got a job at Kent State, Antonio Gates transferred once more. This time, bro, this had to be it. Officially a junior when he got to Kent State, Antonio knew he didn't have time to waste. But his habits had slipped and he wasn't in peak shape, so he apparently faked a heart attack during a conditioning test. There he was, a future NFL Hall of Famer, laid out on the floor too exhausted to go on. His teammates encouraged him. They'd heard about the man-child who dominated Detroit high school and AAU circuits. They knew about how the transfers had really stacked up, and they knew there was a chance he wouldn't stay here long either. But still, halfway through the team's conditioning test, Gates pleaded with his teammates to go on without him. They refused. Most had already been through several years of this. They knew every single trick that your mind tried to play on you. They got him to fight through. He made it to the last sprint, then collapses on the floor which means he would fail the test. They hadn't known him long, but teammate Trevor Huffman had already picked up on Gay's competitive nature. Coach Heath yelled, back on the line. Let's go, gentlemen. 10 seconds. Tone will have to try again next week. Huffman yelled. Hold on, coach. He finishing the last one with us. And I'm sure Gates was thinking, man, no the hell I'm not. Huffman turned to him, and instead of trying to reason with his new teammate, he instead decided to attempt a different method. Tone, you can't beat me in a sprint. You're too slow. Tone responds. Shut up, Huff. You know damn well you ain't faster than me. Trevor wrote in great detail how the rest played out. So check out this excerpt from his 2018 blog post. No big man had ever beat me in a sprint ever. In fact, I felt I was the fastest on the team. My first step could get me in the lead most days. And it was our final day of conditioning. It was our last test. We had one more to go, man. Tone couldn't quit. Not now. Not while he was so damn close. I winced. 
The thought of doing this again made my bowels churn. Tone, you not fastening me. I yelled in his direction. His face changed immediately. He sat up breathing deeply, like a drunk man trying to sober up to drive home. Then, he pushed himself off the ground rather gravely. Pouring down with sweat, he walked up to the line. The whistle blew, and I sprinted 94 feet towards the end of the Memorial Athletic Convocation Center. I peeked over my shoulder. A rookie mistake. It was Antonio f***ing Gates, motivated to win. He wasn't smiling, he wasn't grinning, and he damn sure wasn't laughing. He was as focused and calm as I'd ever seen him be. Every single arm swing cut across his body like an axe. At half court, he was catching me. At the other free throw line, he was tied with me. I pushed hard with my last few strides. There was nobody near us, just me and him. Antonio Gates did what he said he was gonna do. He passed me in a blaze of fury and wind. Breathing like Usain Bolt with a megaphone attached to his face. It was official. I had lost my first race ever to a big man. Kent State had what Huffman described as a cluster of unwanted, misfit high school and college players. And as crazy as it was, man, this future Hall of Famer was exactly that within the basketball world. All these dudes wanted to do was hoop as long as they could. Every one of them had been told that they should do something else. They played hard, practiced hard, and took pride in their craft. And if you play ball, you know that's the hardest team to beat. Once Gates was initiated, man, he fit in perfectly, and they took Kent State further than the school had ever gone. That season, Gates started as a 6'4 power forward in the mold of a Charles Barkley with his all-around skills. He averaged 16 points, 8 rebounds, and 3 assists as a junior, as him and Trevor Huffman actually led the team in scoring. After a 9-5 start, the team really started clicking, and from mid-January all the way to mid-March, they didn't lose. So they went from 9-5 to 24. Four and five and in a conference tournament they won every game comfortably this was all on their way to becoming mac champions which earned them a bid for the ncaa tournament as a 10 seed they upset seven seed oklahoma state then they upset two seed alabama and made it to the sweet 16. once there they faced off against pitt who was a three seed in an overtime thriller with kent state coming out on top this ragtag team made it all the way to the elite eight where they were finally put out of the tournament by Indiana. While Gates was just a junior, the next three leading scorers were all seniors making their final run at glory. Antonio hadn't been able to get them to their ultimate goal, but they did make it further than anybody thought they could. The next season, Gates raised his game to lead a different group. He raised his averages across the board, 20 points, 8 rebounds, and 4 assists, all with better efficiency numbers. After a 19-8 season, they made it to the conference championship game once again, but this time came up short and that meant they wouldn't be a part of the larger NCAA tournament. For Antonio Gates, man, the hoop dream was over. He was considered too much of a tweener to make it in the NBA. But once again, his high school coach, Kent State assistant Rob Murphy, was looking out for his best interest, even behind his back. I can remember his senior year, still was talking about he wanted to play basketball. I'm like, Antonio, I remember sitting him down in the office at Kent State, and we made a deal. He was going to Portsmouth. I said, Antonio, if you go to Portsmouth and you don't come back as one of the top two players out of this camp, you got to give football a try. He was like, okay, bet. If I'm not the top two players at Portsmouth, I'm going to come back and I'm gonna pursue football. He didn't know, but a month prior to that, during the basketball season his senior year, me and Rob Sinderoff, who was a, another assistant coach at Kent, we got together, put together a letter. We sent it out to 30 NFL teams with his profile, why he had attended Michigan State. And after the season, we felt they should come in and take a look at him in a workout. So that letter went out to all the NFL team. I made this deal with Antonio. I knew he wasn't going to come back as one of the top two players in sports. <laughs> yeah. right? I already knew that. I knew how good he was, but I know how the, the game is played at Portsmouth. It's a dominated camp by guards, right? That are trying to yeah. make it to the league. So he comes back, not one of the top two players. I sat him down. I said, okay, you made this deal. I said, but this is what we did a month ago. I explained to him the letter we sent out and teams start calling. So I was acting as his agent. We set it up, I think six teams came in to see him work out at Kent State. We set it up, we went over and talked to the football coaches. They let us use the football indoor practice facility. So six teams came into Kent State to watch him work out on sort of like a pro day. And just all off this letter we had sent out. Well, he went in and worked out, went and got one of the uh, Kent State quarterbacks. He caught the football for about, I would say 20 to 30 minutes 
minutes, just running different routes. After that workout, five teams left, one team stayed. It was a guy named Tim Brewster. At the time, the tight ends coach for the San Diego Chargers. And he asked me, did Antonio have an agent? I said, no, I'm kind of running this process. You know, we don't know how this is going to work out, but I think he can, you know, play in the NFL. He said, well, can I take you guys to dinner tonight? So we went to dinner that night in Ken. I said, Antonio, you got to go with me. This tight ends coach want to meet you. So we had the dinner talking. He talking football with Antonio, getting to know him. So after the dinner, Antonio leaves. He said, listen, he understands football. I've seen everything I needed to see today. If you get him to sign with us, the San Diego Chargers, I promise you, I promise you, he'll be a pro bowler in three years. I'm like, I'm looking like, are you serious? Like, I, you know, some guys get to talking and trying to like, just recruit you. First off, man, his coach is legendary for this, for real, as he pretty much facilitated Gates' chance to get in the league. And it can be really important to have good people in your corner, seeing your potential when you couldn't see it for yourself. Gates goes on the land on the Chargers practice squad before quickly earning a spot on the active special teams. When Gates was still hooping, man, Steven Alexander was making waves in the league at the tight end position. Now Antonio was in practice with him, so he watched his every move trying to learn as much as he could. But before he could learn even a fraction of the information, Steven Alexander goes down with an injury. So being completely raw, not having played since high school, a month into the season, this undrafted rookie, a basketball player who never played a snap of college football, was now a starting player in the NFL. In 11 starts, he caught 24 passes for 389 yards and two touchdowns. In the very next year, his second season in the league, this dude breaks the single season touchdown record for tight ends. 81 catches, 964 yards, and 13 touchdowns for the basketball player. So it seems the Charger scout made good on his promise and it didn't even take the full three years he said in only year two Antonio Gates was a pro bowler not only that he was first team all pro bro I can't just rush through this do you understand what I'm saying his second year in the league he finished over guys like Tony Gonzalez this is after not playing a down in college an undrafted player in only year two after having zero plans to play football ever again he just walked into the league and had a 15 year career he led the league in touchdowns for tight ends five times and he led in tight end yards on three separate occasions in 2017 he caught his 112th career touchdown pass the most ever by any tight end he surpassed another former college basketball player who played the same position and was every bit as cold difference was tony gonzalez was allowed to play both his first and only school kept their promise and he was drafted first round a first rounder versus an undrafted player is about as big of a discrepancy as you'll find in the league. And speaking from a draft position standpoint, like his granddad before him, with this, Antonio Gates was punching way above his weight class. Tony Gonzalez played the equivalent of about two seasons more. And most people you ask will say he's the top tight end in history. And it's not just by reputation, man. He got the stats to prove it. When it comes to receptions and yardage, he's ahead by a mile. But Gates falls into third, still holding off Travis Kelsey. But when it comes to tight end touchdowns, then he's the number one guy. And Gates' touchdown record might actually stand for a pretty long time. Kelsey will probably pass him in yards in the next couple years as he's not showing any signs of slowing down. That said though he is 33 years old and he'd need 47 more touchdowns just to catch up with this crazy high mark that was set by a basketball player. But Gates did it his own way, you know, the much harder way. But it's hard not to wonder how things could have been different if he was allowed to play both sports at Michigan State like he originally planned. He's a first round talent, but every road traveled is different and this was his journey. And getting Kent to the Elite 8 as the team's leading scorer, that's a massive accomplishment and so unique on a resume. I can't imagine that Antonio would have done it any other way. His granddad, Henry Armstrong, had 183 professional fights over the course of 15 years. Ironically, Antonio started 190 professional games over the course of 16 years. So when I say he passed down that durability and longevity, it don't just sound cool, we got real life numbers. Now Antonio's son looks to follow in both of their footsteps, a four-star athlete who's attending Michigan State. 
He's a 6'1", 185-pound wide receiver, so not as big as his dad, but he could be pretty good. He was the number one ranked receiver in the whole state of Michigan, and I really can't wait to see what he's able to do on the college level. He redshirted last season, so maybe he'll play this year. So be sure to keep an eye out for Antonio Gates Jr. Now his dad isn't eligible for the NFL Hall of Fame until 2024, but unless there's BS afoot, he should be first ballot. He absolutely dominated the game from his position, so the Hall of Fame voters better do the right thing. So Antonio Gates' story brings up a valid question. Should you or should you not actually follow your passions? Antonio's passions nearly robbed him of a Hall of Fame career, or depending on your perspective, maybe it guided him to it. What I take from it is that even when it seems I'm on the wrong path, and no matter how many people say I'm going the wrong way, at the end of the day, you gotta do what you think is best. And when it's time to move on, just trust that you'll know. Even when doubt creeps in and I question myself, if I just keep going, putting my all into my passions, if I'm really good enough, I'll eventually find my way. And all the skills that you develop going through these side missions will one day make sense as you achieve legendary status.